from ABC News Radio, KMET 1490 in Southern California. This is Biz Ninja Entrepreneur Radio with your host, Tyler Jorgensen. Welcome out to Biz Ninja Entrepreneur Radio. I am your host, Tyler Jorgensen. And today we have Arjun Rai with us, who is the uh, founder of HelloWoofy.com, which is a really cool platform all about uh, helping businesses who may be underdogs. And I'm going to let him tell you more about the product uh, and what it does and his entrepreneurial journey. We're going to uncover that as we go. Welcome out to the show, Arjun. How are you doing? I'm doing fabulous. And this is the power of Clubhouse. If you guys, you know, listeners out there, if you haven't tried out Clubhouse, join clubhouse.com. I am not being paid to do this, right? And Tyler is not being paid to do this either. We love Clubhouse because this is how you meet some of the most famous entrepreneurs, the famous investors. And through empathy, if you're really, really genuine and you're adding value, people want to connect with you. And this is how Tyler and I, I mean, he asked me to come on his show. So Tyler, it's been such an honor. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, really, I'm, I'm grateful for you coming out because you've been an entrepreneur for a long time. When was the first time you realized that you were an entrepreneur? Age seven or eight or maybe six. I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I was driving my parents insane with uh, selling literally everything in the house for a quarter. I was very obsessed with a quarter. And I remember <laughs> moving out of Colorado and my mom was like, we need to get rid of this furniture instead of like putting a garage sale and things like nature. Cause we had like a, we were in a tall building with an apartments and there was no sense of a garage. So we just, we were going to throw it out. And we happened to be facing a very, very busy road. It wasn't a highway, but it was kind of like a highway. And I had this giant sign, which was maybe like three feet by three feet. And I said, everything must go 25 cents. And literally we had people coming up the staircase and the movers were trying to go down the staircase and they were getting blocked because there were more people coming up than they were going down. And it was said 25 cents. So literally things were like people were coming by and looking at the stuff as people were trying to get out or the movers were trying to get out. My mom was coming back with Chinese food and she saw this sign. She was like, what the heck is going on? <laughs> she took it down. I did the same thing when I was in India at, a, at an Indian wedding. And you know, as I don't know if you've ever been to an Indian wedding, but there are a lot of flowers. Like you could go through like five flower shops worth of flower. And so I was like, why are we wasting these flowers after the wedding? So I took a lot of them, made garlands, almost like a Hawaiian you know, necklace. And I started selling them for a quarter at my grandmother's key. Now, mind you, I'm in India, so the currency doesn't even make any sense selling something for a quarter. But I had a sign that said a quarter, 25 cents on the street. Um, so that's I've always been trying to sell something or the other and try to you know make make something. I just you know make something out of nothing, and that kind of led to my first company, my second company, and being frugal and and being you know resourceful. Uh, and I think we we can talk about that later in the show. But you know you got to start early. That's the that's the one thing that I've learned. Yeah, I think there there is a, a type of entrepreneur that early, five, six, seven years old, they just figured out some kind of little hustle, right? Mm -hmm. um, mine, ha mine was flowers as well. Like I, I would pick flowers <laughs> and sell them to the, to the local neighborhood um, old lady, right? And there were usually flowers I picked from her front yard, but then I'd turn them into a bouquet and I'd go and sell them to her. And, uh, but I mean, you, you know, it's, that's being resourceful, right? And that's being scrappy, if you will. How do you how did you turn that into like your first business? What was the first thing that you did that wasn't just a little side hustle, but it was actually your first business? Well, I was I was going through, you know, as many people as I could find and reach out to them through cold email. I went through the Forbes 400 list. There was something called a Google phone book back in the day. So I was like, I, let me see if I can reach these billionaires who, you know, have their phone numbers on, you know, on, on the public records. And I started calling a couple of them and some of them actually picked up the phone or their maids did. And then they relayed my 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 message to, to the person itself. So I've always found myself in a position where I was like, I want to reach out to someone and nothing's going to hold me back. Um, I want to get their advice. I want to get their mentorship. I want to get their resources and their connections. Um, so I started that at 16, 16, 17 or so. I did, did a company with a couple of other teenagers. But the second company that I did was an agency, a social media agency. I literally started it because I needed to, quote unquote, make it in New York and pay the bills. So, I mean, I was living off like $1,000 a month. You know, 700 went to as a rent, 25 for utilities, and the rest was food and subways. Um, so you can only imagine how scrappy I had to be in order to make that, make that go a long way. But through the agency, I learned that not only me, but other startups, other founders, other influencers were struggling even more so to kind of make, you know, make ends meet. And they didn't have the resources. They didn't have the know-how. And, you know, to be honest, you could have picked up a book, gone to a YouTube channel and things of that nature, but they wanted to hire me to kind of do the work for them, which is the, you know, the kind of the agency model. 
Yep. And so one thing led to the other. I ended up doing my second, the third company because of that raise of venture capital. And then what we're doing today is a very similar mindset is how can I take everything I've learned, put it into an AI driven system, and then allow, allow that to impact not just a couple of lives, but millions of lives, tens of millions of lives around the world for underdogs. Yeah. And so there's there's a couple of things I want to make sure we unpack. And this is the right way, right time for us to get into really what is Hello Woofy mm-hmm. and who does it serve and how does it help people. But before we do that, what I think is fascinating is a lot of people get stuck in the place where you started, which is like, okay, they move from like I, I have a need. I'm mm-hmm. I start a little age, I start an agency, but you kept thinking bigger, right? Yeah. Like, how do I scale? How do I go big? How do I serve more people? And I think that's a fascinating mindset thing that really represents what I would consider the difference between a business owner and an entrepreneur, right? Like, you know, you're, you continue to innovate, continue to think bigger. Talk to us, Arjun. What is Hello Woofy? Who does it serve? Absolutely. So Hello Woofy, in, in, in my, in, in, as a slow slogan, I like to say it's smart marketing for underdogs, aka small businesses, people who are listening in today, people like you, people like me, who are, you know, who just gets, are getting started. They need the resources, they need the know how they need to figure out what is working and how to emulate that the next time around, right? So typically, social media platforms, they tend to look very old school, very clunky, right? And I'm just going to give you a, a, an example here on, on the screen share, a lot of the tools, they tend to look like this. And of course, we have respect for all of our competitors. What do you, for the viewers who are, or the listeners who are listening in, this is a very clunky, old school, oversimplified solution, which doesn't tell you that was it the words that did well, the emojis, the hashtags, the images, what actually did well. So you can, you know, utilize your resources better the next time you have to come up with a content, right? But you'd expect that to be true, that cap- those capabilities existing in enterprise solutions. But guess what? A solution like this, again, we have a lot of respect for our competitors, even the enterprise solutions, makes you feel like you need a PhD in marketing to understand how do you take any of the data, very little science, so there's very little data science, a lot of bar charts, a lot of tech clouds, a lot of you know pie charts and things of that nature, but you have no idea what part do you take to craft the perfect message. And by the way, Tyler, this is going to cost you half a million dollars at the minimum a year to be able to you know create something. So we were like, why can't we build something that is artistic, that is beautiful, and intelligent for the price of a cup of coffee. So for $4.08, everything we're about to talk about today, you can do for social media marketing, you can do it for blogging. And we've been working with Amazon to build smart speaker marketing, which is very timely. You can now schedule content directly into the living rooms of your customers. So just as an example, if I want to type in, how are you, right? It'll automatically complete the sentence for me. And for viewers who are, uh, or for listeners who aren't able to see, as I'm typing, it's completing the words for me. So I love, and I'm just typing LOV, it's all automatically completing the word love for me and then suggesting you after that. And I'm going to type in and my coffee, I'm just going to type in COF and it's going to complete the word for me. But below, guess what's happening in real time? It's giving me recommendations for emojis. So it recommended the coffee emoji. It recommended the heart emoji with the smiley face. But why are we doing this? You know, people are probably thinking like, you're insane. Why, why are emojis so important? Well, here's why. 58% uplift in engagement, 64% uplift in purchase intent, according to the Adobe Emoji Trend Report, which came out in July of 2019. So what did we do? We mapped the entire English language to literally figure out which words, which emojis, which hashtags, which other emojis based on those hashtags and words tend to be used with one another so that we can give you the capability to make the perfect recommendations in real time. And we went one step wow. further. We were like, why can't we show you which ones are being used right now? So you can make a data-driven solution. And if you click the purple dot, we'll even figure out the perfect images for you that are royalty-free so you don't get in trouble. So this wow. was the kind of capability that I wanted to provide a small business owner for the price of a cup of coffee so that they can compete, literally compete effectively with unlimited marketing budgets. Because before this, you couldn't have done that. So amazing. Um, and for Thank anybody, you. like the number of small business owners that I talk to who social media absolutely stresses them out. Mm -hmm. And it's because it's not just, we'll do a post, right? It's, well, what image do I post? Well, what what caption do I write? Do I need to use an emoji? Do I write one sentence? Do I do a paragraph? You know, who do I tag? Like there's so many variables and hashtags and all these things that to someone who works in social media, it may not seem overwhelming, but to someone who's just trying to run their day-to-day business, but knows they need to do posting, it can be really, really daunting. Um, and that's really, yep. it sounds like that's the main thing you're trying to solve. 
Hundred percent, two thousand percent. That's it's it's for people who literally do not have certifications or you know a degree in social media marketing. It's you're absolutely correct. What do we help? What do we do for the small businesses who are baristas, nail shop salon, you know, nail shop owners, or you know, coffee shop owners, coaches, you know, this, you know, dry cleaners. They, they this isn't their expertise, but they know the the benefits and the power of digital marketing, especially during COVID, when people are looking to you know they're buying more smart speakers, they're you know going online, they can you know, retail stores are closed. Digital marketing, where it would have been in five years, you have to be there today. And in fact, you should have been there a week ago. Yeah. And I think, I think that kind of balance of time is really fascinating. I feel like there's a, the, the, everything that's happened in 2020 and coming into 2021 really made a requirement for people that they couldn't stay outdated any longer. Like this are, they should have been doing this already. But it was yep. you can't pretend you can't ignore it anymore. It it's uh, it's so much more important. I, I tell this story a lot. Like we work with physical product brands, and five years ago, when if we were like trying to get a, a supplement into GNC, the mm. buyer at GNC would say, "Well, how much are they spending on television ads?" Now they ask, "Well, what does their Instagram look like?" <laughs> and like the change of what of what is important even to it's other companies. Mindset. Well, it's a mindset. It's also the fact that what they've learned is that people will be in a retail store mm-hmm. and they'll see a new product. And the first thing they do is check the Instagram to see if the if the brand looks credible yep. and if they look real. And that people, people are doing that same thing when they're walking, checking out a new coffee shop, right? They're mm-hmm. checking to see what is your digital footprint? What are people saying about you online? All of those things. And so just by simply looking more credible right? By posting more frequently, higher quality, better engagement, all those things, Yep. business and growth. Even if, even if that post doesn't directly drive revenue, it saves potential lost revenue. And that's what we're seeing yep. on our side yep. of things. But so as you got started with Hello Woofy, what was the first major hurdle that you had to overcome and how did you overcome it? Well, funding has always been an interesting part of, of, of every, every entrepreneur's life, right? So we we started with a couple thousand dollars. We built an MVP. We hired a team off of Upwork and we got the MVP built. We got 10,000 downloads um, and uh, we raised a small check from one of Peter Thiel's Scout Ventures, 1517. And, uh, and, and then we were like, here's the dem- you know, here's the product. We ended up building it even better. We got about, we got, we got about 10,000 downloads. And then we were like, okay, the feedback is coming in. They want a, a desktop version. <laughs> so they they didn't care about the on the go solution for social media management. We thought that was a, that was going to be true, but obviously the customer is always right. So we then got into an Acceler program. We raised about 100k from them. We raised another 100k from 1517, and uh, very quickly we figured out that we had made a series of bad hires um, mm. from people who who had recommended these individuals, and uh, we had trusted them, and we made a series of bad hires. So by the end of that, we ended up, uh, and these were technical hires, so obviously very costly, especially in the in New York or in the U.S. So we ended up right. coming down to, you know, through marketing expenses and rent and all of this stuff, we ended up having about twelve thousand dollars left in the bank. Uh, this is the beginning of 28, uh, middle of 2018 or beginning of 2018. And um, unfortunately, I had to let go of my co-founder at, at the same time, our CTO, wow. someone who else was uh, was brought in to help us on the tech side. They, you know, they just, it wasn't working out. And my co-founder are, are definitely friends again today. It's good. But um, yeah, life's, life's too short to hold, you know, hold grudges for sure. I but, agree. Uh, but then, uh, you know, I was I was with twelve thousand dollars, with maybe three months of burn, and I, I told my investors, and they said, you know, you can you can shut the company down. We'll do we'll invest in the next thing. Let's see, you know, what are you working on next? And I was like, no, I'm gonna make this work, and no matter what. So long story short, I found a second job. I put in 170k into the company, mostly on credit cards, which definitely helps to have a lot of credit cards uh, when while your credit score is <laughs> your credit score is good, um, because that ended up allowing me to rebuild a company from scratch, um, the product from scratch, the way it should have been built in the first place. And uh, I was working, you know, five o'clock in the morning through eight o'clock, you know, on the company. Then I was doing my second job, and then the evenings from seven to midnight because our our teams were international. We ended up launching uh, towards the end of 2019 and. December uh, to the public. We relaunched. And just before that, my mom ended up passing away in September. Um, sure. There was a TV show that had, you know, rejected us, uh, you know, they, you know, and then they called us back and they said, Hey, we've got a couple of more spots on the TV show. Would you like to fly out of California to film it? And this said, this was literally days after my mom had passed away. And I was like, what is what is the universe telling me? Because I'm very spiritual. I believe in the law of attraction and the secret by Rhonda Byrne. Great book, by the way, for entrepreneurs. Um, I was like, what is the universe telling me? So long story short, 
flew out to flew out to uh, to uh, California. Ended up winning second place in the show. We ended up launching in December. We ended up doing six hundred thousand, just below six hundred thousand dollars in equity crowdfunding last year. We did two hundred, little over two hundred thousand dollars in revenue. We grew twenty one thousand percent. We did twenty two million API calls last year, and we served nearly eight thousand small businesses around the world. So. It was a miracle, to say the least. And we continue growing. I mean, Clubhouse has been great. We just soft circle about two hundred seventy-five, you know, three hundred thousand dollars in capital. Um, all, you know, small pieces of it are coming in into our bank account very soon. And uh, and Clubhouse is now our third highest source of organic revenue. Like it's been wow. a miracle after a miracle. So long as you keep your head in the game. <laughs> That was uh, a phenomenal story with a lot of data points that I won't remember. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> the ones I will remember are that you're serving over 8,000 customers now. Because um, to me, like any business raising capital, cool, right? Um, even crowdfunding shows some kind of a promise of the business. But the real metric of, of a successful business is, are the target, I, like is the customer wanting mm -hmm. the product, right? Yep. There's been a lot of businesses that could raise investment capital, that could raise all kinds of things, but couldn't make it work. And it sounds like you're turning the, the a big part of what you're doing is really getting usage and getting uh, utilization up, which is amazing. The, the customer is always right. And if you're able to build a company right alongside the customer, because in our case, and our customers are investing a hundred dollars, you know, at a time, or you know, one customer put in ten thousand dollars into the company. He believed in our vision so much. It's a, the mission is completely separate, you know, completely different. Then uh, it it feels more genuine. Our mission is to build the biggest company in the world, helping the smallest. Well, why don't we let the smallest businesses who are customers also own a piece of our company as we scale? And you can only imagine the generational wealth we can create with them as we're building the biggest company. You know, they can pass it down to their other, you know, other descendants, other generations as well. It's a completely different way. This goes beyond building a B Corp. This goes beyond a benefits yeah. corporation. This is this is much, much bigger. And I'm really grateful for equity crowdfunding to allow that. Yeah. So maybe explain to the audience a little bit about the difference between crowdfunding, like a normal Kickstarter, yeah. uh, where you get, you know, usually on a, on a traditional Kickstarter, you're, you're putting money in and you're getting uh, a, a premium bundle of whatever something is, maybe, you know, extra month services or whatever. But in equity crowdfunding, walk us through your guys' model and what you're doing. Yeah. So I'll, I'll screen share my, my uh, computer again. So very simply, crowdfunding, it means that you're putting couple of dollars into a product that you want to receive a cup you know a couple of months down the road ideally it's you know sometimes it might be delayed sometimes it might come in early but you're put you're believing in a mission you believe in the team and you just want a great deal on the product and that's it you don't own the company i mean there's some examples of companies that have raised a lot of money they have a lot of believers in their product and they sold for billions of dollars hundreds of millions of dollars and the customers never benefited well, then what if I can tell you, you can benefit in getting the product early for a discount, plus you can own equity, um, or at least at least have the promise to own equity and shares in the company. And so as a company scales because of you and your, 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 your dollars at work, then what if, you know, if they exit and you can make a multiple of that as well. So just to give you an example, last year we did two campaigns and we raised $564,244 on, on Republic. And this year, I mean, this in the last couple of weeks, we've been able to raise thirty-three thousand dollars, and we already have commitments to uh, raise another, you know, uh, twenty-five to fifty k here. And there, we know investors are going to be putting it in the campaign. That means that the campaign is going to not only looks better because you know, obviously, we're getting usage from our customers. Potential investors are looking at it, but it makes we're like I said before, we can build a company right alongside our customers. And as we as we scale, the underdogs, the small businesses, scale, you know, their investment as well. So I highly so, recommend people. Yeah. Doing so so these are convertible notes, right? So it's not you're when you put hundred bucks on one of these, you're not rec receiving shares or something right away, right? It, there's a yeah. In time. the first case, it was a safe. In the in the current um, campaign that we're doing, it's a convertible note. But you're right; it's a promise to shares. Um, and then, depending on liquidation, if we sell the company, if we IPO, or there's a change of management, those triggers will occur. But you know, this is kind of going. And that just makes it a lot easier. <laughs> that that just yeah. makes it a lot easier for the like how investments work and shares yeah. and all those things to say, hey, it's a promise of shares, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but and it's triggered at a at a later date, so it keeps Absolutely. it more simple. Very cool. Yep. yep. So what? Uh, let Let's kind of unpack a little bit about where you are now and who you're serving. So we've talked a little bit about um, like you're serving the local the local smaller business that doesn't have big budgets for marketing, but knows that they need to do the basics, right? 
you guys are helping them do social media posts, blog posts. What other types of things are you helping them accomplish? Well, the other thing we also built is a Google Chrome extension. And the Google Chrome extension not only allows you to schedule and add content from anywhere on the internet. So if you find yourself on you know, your website with your blog, or if you go to the New York Times and you like an article there, there's no need to come back to Hollywood if you schedule it and add it to your library. Just hit the Google Chrome extension and you can do it right there and schedule it and be done with it. But the other benefit of the Chrome extension is that you can literally type anywhere on the internet in any input field. So if you can think about the total addressable market of an input field, Evernote, Twitter, Facebook, Medium, you can literally autocomplete um, you know, entire sentences, entire words, and then double click to switch it up for the right emoji, which again, statistically do does really well for driving engagement, right? And right. then we were like, we need to expand beyond just social and blogging because those those are industries that have been around for a very long time. But 82% growth in smart speakers, specifically Alexa devices, we were like, why can't we turn these devices, this is an Echo Dot in my hand or the Echo Show, which is also here as a touchscreen or Fire TV. Why are the biggest companies only able to schedule uh, or broadcast to those devices, right? right. Um, why is there a monopoly? What, what about the small businesses? So for the last six months, we've been building something called the Smart Speaker Scheduler with, the, with help of um, uh, Amazon, the Alexa division that allows you to literally schedule content directly into the living rooms of your customers. So if you can see here, this is a, uh, a mock-up of what that looks like, essentially. Um, you'll be able to see you know, the home speaker, you know, the home speaker on the front, you're seeing the Alexa devices around, and you can schedule video, audio, and text to audio content directly to those customers. So it's, I mean, it's, it's now allowing you to really scale. Uh, and yeah, keep, keep going. It's allowing you to scale. I mean, like never before. Like you, every single day. Here's an example of a video I, I, you know, we made on our, on our, um, on our platform. You can see I'm going to be scheduling a Oprah Winfrey video, and within five seconds, I'm going to have go to my my Fire TV and have it schedule the video right there. And you could have a, you could be like, you know, this is the Tyler day of the, you know, the top tip of the day. And to my right, if you look at this is the tip of the day in the in the words in words, and then you can click right there using the remote and then go to Tyler's website or the web, you know, the webinar link or sign up to your newsletter, whatever you need right on the TV for $4 and eight cents a month. Man, that that's fascinating. Yeah. Um, so now you and I can broadcast tips, right. podcasts, whatever we want. And you can run campaigns using the same, it's the same design you saw earlier for inside Hello Wolfie. Yeah. Cause I mean, we've planned on doing that with the show for a long time and we just never got it done because it's complicated, right? It's tough. Yeah. Well, here we go. Yeah. <laughs> now we got it figured out. I have, I have just so the audience knows before we even uh, got scheduled to be on the call, I did um, buy an annual, uh, Hello, Woofy. <laughs> Virtual hug, right there. Virtual yeah, hug. whatever it's called. Yeah, <laughs> because uh, because I love the concept, and even if even though I haven't used it yet, I know our team eventually will, and uh, and I love supporting small businesses in their growth. And you guys are very quickly not going to be considered a small business. You're already you're already <laughs> starting to le- get towards the medium size of things. Yep. Um, and that's, but that's amazing. And, uh, congratulations on that. And I, I know you've got big things coming, which is even cooler. What, what would you say to, you know, someone who's at the early days of their business? Um, you've mentioned some things along the way, but mm-hmm. like when people get stuck, like, so I'm going to address it, kind of couch it a little bit. You have not only saved this, this business once from almost closing, but you have also done and, and moved on to other businesses, right? So there's a time when you need to dig in and make it work. And there's a time that you need to just close the doors and move forward. How do you separate the two? I I personally felt compelled that this business had to exist for small businesses, for other startups, for other founders, especially at the level that I was at. And I, I'm literally no different than, you know, I'm not that much different. I'm not like ascending, like this isn't a spiritual ascending. Sure. <laughs> um, I, I believe that small businesses should have the ability to compete effectively against the biggest companies in the world. Not because the biggest companies have more resources, but more, more you know, marketing personnel. But, it, it, you know, at the end of the day, the person who can storytell, can captivate an audience should be the winner at the end of the day. But and small businesses tend to do the best and except they don't have the resources to be able to compete. So if I can level the playing field, that was a calling I had, you know, two, three you know, years ago. I was like, I need to build this to scale. And no matter what came at me, you know, from a financial perspective, from an emotional perspective, from a economic perspective, whatnot, 
so long as you believe in some idea, I believe that the law of attraction does work out for you. Everything happens for a reason. And, and like Steve Jobs said, don't connect the dots looking forward, connect the dots looking back. There are so many people that came into my life that made no sense whatsoever at the moment. But thinking back, one person knew someone else, someone made an introduction, someone gave me resources, someone wrote me a check, just blindly wrote me a check because she believed in me. Like that's, it's just uh, things work out for the right reasons at the end of the, at, at the end of the day. And so I would say, keep moving, keep moving forward. If you're, conv- if you have a strong conviction, sense of conviction that this needs to exist, and if you're kind of doing it as a side hustle, I, I have a, I have a, I have a slight problem with the term side hustle. It means you don't have conviction that you're doing it as a passive income. You're doing it just because you have extra capital to deploy. But if you're not obsessed with the business and the people you're looking to serve, then it's just a hustle, and you know. It, it will just fade away, you know, as soon as something, you know, comes along the way and that, you know, kind of flips, you know, flips us on his head. Yeah. I think, uh, so I love that. Okay. As we get towards the end here, I want you to give a few, drop a few more tips for those who sure. are, are trying to ascend and trying to get things, <laughs> get momentum going in their business. Here we go. I'm ascending. <laughs> yeah, no, Hey, don't, don't be shy about it. It's okay. We got to be able to help people that are behind sure. us and reach yeah. towards those in front of us and reach yeah. side to side. Sometimes it's uh it's not a um, status thing. Well, but, just on that point, yeah. you know, on, on the point of like side to side, right. Or, or, or whatnot, we actually partner with our biggest competitor on planet earth, 18 million social media professionals named Hootsuite. I'm sure a lot of your viewers and listeners will know about Hootsuite. I reached out to Ryan. I was like, Hey, a lot of your customers want to use our platform on top of your platform. Why do we integrate? And so we're literally the only competitive co-creating partner in their app store serving 18 million, potentially 18 million you know, customers with our platform. And that's conventional wisdom and, and uh, you know, business schools will not tell you to do that. Right. How do you co-create, right? And, we've, and Clubhouse, we've been talking about joint ventures and whatnot, but how do you co-create with your competitors? It's a very different mindset. It's a, not, it's a non-zero-sum mindset. And I, I encourage people to think about it because they, they could be your biggest channel partners and who knows, potentially an acqu- acquisition. Yeah, I'm a big I'm a big believer of avoiding zero sum mindset. Um, what are what are like two or three business like books that you think every entrepreneur should read? Oh, Grant Cardone's um, you know the Closer Survival Guide to Sales. Uh, I've read that book so many times. I actually had the privilege of meeting Grant right backstage as I was coming up. He was going downstairs down to, on onto the on the TV set because um, we I had mentioned we were on a TV show and he was going to be on the next episode after we after we filmed gotcha. ours. And I told him I love your book. I used all of your tactics into and, and we raised you know hundreds of thousands of dollars as a result of it. He was like he was he pointed to his camera guy. He was like film him right now. And so he interviewed me and he. Asked Ask me like what are some of the tips and, and tricks. So I highly recommend that book. The other book I recommend, of course, you know, we're both obsessed with Russell Brunson, is Expert Secrets and Traffic Secrets, specifically because one talks about the mindset and the other talks about tactics you can employ to generate a lot more capital or a lot more sales by using sales funnels. Now, of course, we can, I mean, I can recommend click funnels, but if you can't afford click funnels, there are themes you could be using on, on ThemeForest or Envato. You could have a Fiverr developer for $25, $50, $100 at a time develop the sales funnel for you, put some Facebook pixels on it, put some paid advertising behind it, run some Facebook, you know, lookalike audiences. This is like, I'm going through a lot of things that I had to learn over months very quickly. But right. that's how you generate wealth. We did two hundred dollars. We did build a two hundred dollars sales funnel, and we generate over one hundred forty thousand dollars in sales off of it. So you can do it. And we haven't cross sold or upsold yet. You can only imagine what we could have done if we did that. So just start. Just awesome. start. Let's do it. Really, really good selection there. All right, Arjun. I hope everyone should go check out hellowoofy.com. And uh, <laughs> if you are, you know. If you're if you were compelled by what Arjun was saying, you know, check out their crowdfunding campaign that they have currently running over at WeFunder. Um, Arjun, appreciate you. All my business ninjas, it is your turn to go out and do something. Thank you for listening to Biz Ninja Entrepreneur Radio with Tyler Jorgensen. Please make sure to subscribe so you're first to hear new interviews and episodes. If you found this podcast to be valuable, please share it with a friend. Don't forget to visit our online dojo at bizninja.com to claim your reward for listening to the show.